Good evening, everyone. Just like you, last week Saturday, I went out to vote. And um, I voted in Apple. I got to my polling unit around 8.30. I, don't, I thought it would be quick, but they had increased the number of people assigned to that polling unit. In fact, over 4,000 people were assigned to that polling unit. And over 1,200 showed up to vote. So the line was long. By the time I came to collect number, my number was 812, 8.30 in the morning. But what else am I doing now? Is it not just to wait? So we stood in line and we waited. When the line wanted to scatter, some of us organized ourselves and ensured that it was orderly. When the rain fell, we stood in the rain. After it fell, we rearranged the line and ensured that things were going. When the coppers said that they are hungry, nobody has given them food, we went and bought food and we gave them. When they said, oh, it's getting dark, they want to, they said, don't worry. Somebody went and brought generator, brought light, we gave them. I did not end up voting until 8.30 in the night. Voting did not end in my polling unit till 11 in the night because we said everybody that wrote their name on that list before 2.30 must vote. At 11.30, it ended, we started counting the votes. House of Reps, Senate, Presidency. All of them, Labour Party, swept. We didn't finish counting those votes till about 5.30 in the morning. When we finished counting, we said, you must upload in our front. So we stood there. They told us that they can't upload. We said, we are not going to leave here until the results are uploaded. It was not until about 7.38 in the morning that the guy uploaded the results, or told us he uploaded, and showed us something that said he had uploaded. So we left that polling unit 8.30 in the morning on Sunday. 24 hours we were in that polling unit. We became friends in that polling unit. I met so many first-time voters on that polling unit. The one that touched my heart the most was around 8 in the morning, a couple walked into the polling, that place. They were on their way to the police station to go and report that their son was missing because they had not seen him all night. And the mother just said, let me just check the polling booth. And they found the boy there. <laughs> First time voter. He had come out to vote and stayed out all night counting the vote with us without telling his parents. That is the type of energy that Peter will be inspired in people. It was not the tactical or cynical voting of experienced politicians. This was people voting with their hearts, with their soul, with their conscience. I've voted before, many times, in elections that were rigged. After voting, when you hear the election was rigged, you just say, Tall, no problem, and you go. Because anyway, A or B, they are not different. But in an election where you voted with your heart, rigging is like rape. It's like you've just been raped. Yes, there, is an, there is a hurt you feel that you can't describe. I went online to check for the results of my polling unit. I didn't see it. I said, so what was it that person said he uploaded at that polling unit? For three days, we, I didn't see my results on that IRF portal. What were they doing for three days? 
if you are playing a football match and the players are cheating, it is bearable. But if you're playing a football match and the referee is cheating, we cannot bear that. That is institutional rigging. It is worse than corruption, individual corruption. It's systemic corruption. There are three things technology was supposed to do for us at the polling unit. One, verify the voter. Number two, once the results are announced and written, transmit it electronically to the next collation center. And then number three, upload it to the portal so that the public can see. Those are three things technology was supposed to do. And those things were there for a reason. You see, the moment you upload the result from the polling unit, you are protecting the polling unit officer. Because all the thugs now know that there is, no, there is no benefit in hijacking, waylaying, brutalizing, beating anybody because the result don't go. So you're protecting their lives. But these people don't care about the lives of human beings. Number two, it gives transparency. We are not power hungry. I grew up doing sports. If you fight and you lose, at the end you bow to your opponent. We go meet again next time. There is nothing in losing honorably to somebody that beats you fair and square. But some people don't have honor. They don't mind to kill. They don't mind to steal just to stay in office. In Kano, they burnt people in a building. At least two people have been reported they are burnt in a building by a politician for power. When thieves and murderers are in power, stealing and murder can never stop in the land. It's not possible. You cannot give what you do not have. And there is no amount of road or bridge that you can build that can compensate for the lives that you have taken. We cannot be bribed with road and bridge and rice. When our brothers and sisters, our children, are being consumed so that people can stay in office. So this is a struggle. It is an ideological, it is a principled struggle. You see, the generation that Nigeria was good to, the generation that went to school and slept one one in a room, at a university we were eating free food in canteen, the generation that as you come out of university you have a job with a car, the generation that Nigeria was good to is the generation that has turned around and raped the country to death. But I tell you, the generation that has been born in the wilderness, the one where no seafood chop, the one that slept 10-10 in a room at university, the one that had to walk five years on the road with a first-class degree before they got their first job, it is that generation that will save Nigeria. That is the irony of the country we live in because Nigeria is destined for greatness, but the country has been hijacked by thieves and murderers in power. So we must stay the course. And there are two things that we must watch out for. There are two ways they are going to try and derail us. One, they are going to try to split the movement along ethnic and religious grounds. So they'll start telling you that Peter Obi is an Igbo candidate, is a Christian candidate. You have to be wise and avoid that trap. Because we know that he's neither a Christian candidate nor an Igbo candidate. He's a candidate for those that believe that the end does not justify the means. If we called excellency, then follow an excellent path. So don't allow anybody to make you tribalize this thing. Peter Obi, I'm an Igbo guy. Peter Obi does not belong to Ndi Igbo. And as Igbos, let's be careful not to begin to sh show possessiveness over him as if now we get and pass other people. No, be we get and pass other people. If now only we support him, he no go go anywhere. 
let us always ensure that other tribes and other religions are comfortable in our meetings. Let us always make space and be sensitive to their own needs and desires. Those of us Labour Party candidates that have won election here in the FCT and other places, where as a non-indigenous you have won election in a place outside of your state of origin, be wise. Be wise and remember to carry the needs of the indigenous in your heart in the way that their own brother did not carry when he was in power. That is how to consolidate on victory. We must avoid the banana peel of tribalism. Let them not scatter us on the grounds of tribalism. The Muslim is my brother. The Idoma is my brother. The Fulani is my brother. As long as we both believe in a country where everybody is equal before the law. The only division here is between those who will do anything for political power and those who will not. And Peter Obi will not. And I will not. That is who we are. So let them, please, it's very important because they will try very hard. The number two thing they will try is to say that you're an anarchist or press briefing. And I said, then I should go to court. I am going to court. That is who we are. Even though we know that the court is compromised. Even though we know that some people have been investing in the judiciary for years to ensure that in situations like this, the judgments may go their way. Still, we believe in the rule of law and therefore we will go to court. Because there is God in heaven and you never know what can happen. You never know what can happen. And I tell you, even if they win in that court, they cannot win in the court of public opinion. That tag of thief will stay with you for the rest of your life. Every time your name is mentioned, the 2023 election will be a subtext in your profile and your CV for the rest of your life. There is no law in this country that stops me. Every time you walk into the room, I may rise up in respect because you are president or you are minister. But when you pass, I could say, Olinier, Barao, Onyoshi. Nothing can stop me from saying that under my breath because that is social censure and you can never avoid social censure. So my people, do not be moved. Don't let anybody push you into a tribalistic response. Don't let anybody push you into an anarchist response. No, we respect the constitution. We respect the law because one day our own person will be in that office. And the day our own person is in that office, the same way me, I chop him when your person was there. You go chop him when my person is there. So we must respect and preserve the sanctity of that office. We are going to court. And anything can happen in court. It is 50-50. As rigged as the system is, it is 50-50. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is possible that we can reclaim that mandate through the court. It is very, very possible. But more than that, whatever happens, this government that is coming must not be totally in the grip of the APC and the cabal, not even the APC, the cabal inside the APC. Because again, many APC people, we get sense, we get conscience. We know like waiting they happen. For that cabal inside, this government must not be totally in their grip. That is why it is important that six people from Labour Party are in the Senate. That over 35 people from Labour Party are in the House of Reps. Because they will provide alternative voices. We go here waiting they really happen. Not just one side of the story. And that is why next week Saturday is important. For the obedient movement to really touch down, it must win executive power somewhere. We must get one governor somewhere. We must touch down in one state somewhere. It is important to this revolution, to this struggle. So I know we're in the FCT. We don't get governorship election. But we all come from certain states. Begin now. Whatever you can do. 
If you can travel and give moral support, fine. If you cannot, let your money speak for you. I'm from Abia State. I've already started sending. I've already started sending my resources down. I win in Abia State. Somewhere we must get governor. Because governor now, you know that thing when they say we don't get structure, we the people now the structure. Now we won't add cornerstone to that structure. Now cornerstone we won't add to that structure by winning one, two, three, four, five governorship positions in this country. Because it is not beans for a movement that started seven, nine months ago from nothing. From nothing. Look at where we are now. It shows you the strength of a people. You cannot, dis you cannot defeat a disciplined movement. You can defeat a mob. You can defeat a rabble. You can defeat an anarchist crowd. But a movement where they disciplined, where no waiting they find, you can't defeat it. You cannot break it. So let us remember that our committee that works according to rules and laws. Can you imagine the audacity for INEC to stand up and say it is not compulsory for it to transmit results? Meanwhile, it is in its own bylaw.